Hi there, my name is George Richardson. I'm an integrated medical student from the University of Liverpool, and today I'm going to be talking about brainstem stroke syndromes. Um, I've put my email on the beginning and the last slide, so if there's any questions about the slides, do feel free to contact me um, at the address on screen. So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about uh, stroke terminology. Um, it's perhaps less pertinent to the topic because it doesn't really, it's more um, related to four brain strokes, um, but still thought it'd be worth going over. So the ischemic core is a term that's used um, to refer to an area of irreversible damage, and that usually um, results from occlusion of an end artery, um, which is uh, an artery that's the sole supply uh, to an area of tissue. And there's the ischemic penumbra, which refers to an area of salvageable tissue, and that relates to the concept of time is brain. Um, and that is um, what we try to reverse when we give thrombolysis and mechanical thrombectomy. Um, and that can be sort of uh, demonstrated with homonymous hemianopia, um, and that's um, when you w w um, and you get macular sparing with that, um, and that occurs due to um, the occipital pole having a dual blood supply from both the middle and the posterior cerebral artery. And then hemorrhagic transformation is just uh, where you get an area, uh, you get hemorrhage into an area of infarction, and that uh, relates to thrombolysis as well in the time limit that we set. So the brainstem, as I'm sure most people will know, has a pretty complex um, regional anatomy. Um, and so um, I've come across this brainstem rule of four, which is um, I'm going to try and emphasize because it's a really good way of understanding the complex, um, the complex anatomy that relates to these brainstem stroke syndromes. Um, and so there's four rules, and each rule has four parts to it. Rule number one is to do with cranial nerves. Rule number two um, is related to cranial nerve motor nuclei. Rule number three can be remembered as the midline structures that begin with M. And rule number four is side or lateral structures that begin with S. Um, okay. Also just going to touch briefly on the cranial nerve um, nuclei. Um, and these can be seen in this diagram here. Um, I really like this diagram because it sort of uh, breaks it down quite easily. Um, and it's, it's also includes some of the other structures like the medial longitudinal fasciculus, um, which can be seen there in the centre of the diagram. Um, and so from the midbrain, you have um, cranial nerve uh, nuclei 3, 4, and also brackets 5, because as you can see, it stretches the whole sort of length of the brainstem. Um, from the pons, there's 5, 6, 7, and 8. And from the medulla, um, 5 again, 9, 10, um, and 11. And these can also be seen, as I said, on the diagram to the right here. So rule number one. Um, so this is related to the cranial nerves. And so there are four that um, arise from above the pons, four that arise from the pons, and four that arise from the medulla. The ones that arise from above the pons are cranial nerves one and two. And those come, can be broken down further because those come from above the midbrain. Um, number three and number four, which come from the midbrain. And then from the pons, you have five, six, seven, and eight. And so again, there's four here. Also just to note as well that the vestibular nucleus is located in the lateral medulla. And so that can cause obviously similar um, symptoms to, um, um, to if there is uh, damage to the um, vestibular cochlear nerve as well. Um, and then from the medulla, um, there's cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, and 12. Rule number two relates to the cranial nerve motor nuclei. Um, so um, the best way I think to remember this one, because this is a little bit more of a complicated rule than the others, um, so just remember that there are four, so obviously rule of four, four for each. So the four cranial nerve motor nuclei in the midline are three, four, six, and 12. And they can be remembered e uh, quite easily as the ones that equally divide into uh, 12. And then there are five cranial nerve motor uh, nuclei that exist laterally. And those are five, seven, nine, 10, and 11. And then there are three that have motor nuclei. Uh, and also just to note as well, that the uh, lateral motor nuclei are ones which correspond to innervation of the uh, branchial arches as well, except for cranial nerve 11. So the four midline structures that begin with M. So there's the motor pathway, which is obviously the corticospinal tract. Uh, the medial lumiscus, which is an extension of the dorsal columns, obviously relates to proprioception and vibration. Um, the medial longitudinal fasciculus, now if this is affected, it can cause uh, an intranuclear ophthalmoplegia, 
And basically what this results in um, is an impairment of adduction on the affected side, which leads to nystagmus and diplopia as well when the eyes are moved uh, contralaterally. So basically, um, if, say, for example, my uh, right eye was affected and I tried to um, adduct it, so bring it over to the left, I'd get uh, present with nystagmus and diplopia in that eye. And then the motor nuclei again, um, are these are sort of what was said in the previous previous slide. And then the fourth rule, the final rule, is the four side or lateral structures that begin with S. So you've got the spinal cerebellar pathway, um, the spinal thalamic pathway, um, the sensory nucleus of cranial nerve 5, and the sympathetic pathway, which obviously, if affected, would lead to uh, a Horner syndrome, which I'm sure most people will be familiar with. The clinical presentation um, of these strokes can obviously be quite complicated, and I think that's why people sort of get a bit bogged down in them. Um, so the way I've approached it for this talk is to try and um, touch a bit more on the um, more common ones or the, or the ones that perhaps people are a bit more familiar with and give a little bit of extra detail for them and then just give some one uh, sentence summaries for some of the more um, less common ones or the little ones that perhaps you don't need to know as much about to try and make them stick in the mind a bit more for, example, for, for medical school exams. So the first one to talk about is Weber syndrome, and it's also known as superior alternating hemiplegia. Um, so the, the parts of the uh, brainstem that can be affected with this um, syndrome or that are affected with this syndrome are the substantial nigra, uh, the corticospinal tract, corticobulbar tract, and the oculomotor, um, and oculomotor nerve, sorry. And um, as can be seen um, on the slide, each of these will, will generate corresponding symptoms related to um, the function of that, that sort of structure. Um, and obviously I'm not gonna list them off, but you can sort of see them there. Um, and just to note as well, that this sort of, this syndrome is, is caused by an occlusion of the paramedian branch of the posterior cerebellar artery. Um, and Weber syndrome, which I'll come on to in a little bit again, um, has a bit of overlap between three syndromes, and I think when I come on to that, it will make it a bit clearer um, how to remember these um, these three syndromes, which which have quite considerable overlap. Um, Wallenberg's um, is also known as lateral medullary syndrome, also known as inferior alternating hemiplegia. Um, again, the, the structures that are affected by this type of stroke can be seen on the slide. Um, so there's the vestibular nuclei, um, the inferior cerebellar peduncle, um, the central to, uh, tegmental tract, um, lateral spinal thalamic tract, um, spinal uh, trigeminal nucleus, um, nucleus ambiguous, um, and the descending uh, sympathetic fibres. Um, and again, each of these will relate to um, sim symptoms that are generated due to the, the functional anatomy of the structures. Um, this type of stroke is caused by uh, posterior inferior cerebellar artery stroke, also known as uh, PICA. Um, and I've put this memory aid um, mnemonic here on the screen, DANVA, which is a good way to remember these, uh, the symptoms for Wallenberg's, and that can be broken down into dysphagia, um, ataxia, which is ipsilateral, nystagmus, which is ipsilateral, vertigo, anesthesia, which um, corresponds to um, ipsilateral facial numbness and absent corneal um, reflex with contralateral pain loss, and then um, a Horner syndrome which is a result of obviously the sympathetic fibres being affected. And then just a couple of other ones as well. So there's locked-in syndrome, which I'm sure people may well have heard of, um, and that's due to a basilar artery stroke, um, resulting in a, set, a ventral pontine infarct, um, but can also be caused by central pontine myelolysis, um, which can be also caused by rapid correction of hyponatremia. Um, and then there's millard gubler syndrome as well, um, which is another type of pontine infarct, uh, and that causes 6th and 7th uh, cranial nerve and corticospinal tract de uh, deficiencies. So the one sentence summaries that I've come up with um, for these conditions um, uh, can be seen on the screen here. Um, so these three have considerable overlap, and this is what I was talking about before when I was discussing Weber syndrome. Um, so as you can see um, from, the sentence, from the summaries, um, each of these presents with an ipsilateral third palsy, but the additional symptoms are what sort of defines these these um, these syndromes. So Weber's, um, as previously mentioned, is an ipsilateral third palsy with contralateral weakness of the limbs. And um, you can also get Benedict syndrome, which is an ipsilateral uh, third nerve palsy with contralateral choreoarthritis and ataxia. And then you can also have Clouds syndrome, which is an ipsilateral third nerve palsy 
um, with contralateral limb attacks here as well. And then Wallenberg's, um, as mentioned uh, before, um, is ipsilateral facial uh, pain with the loss of temperature on the contractual side of the body, um, ataxia, nystagmus, and Horner syndrome. Um, and again, that can be remembered with uh, Danver, um, which was said just before. And then you've also got uh, Dejerine syndrome, uh, which is a contractual hemiplegia um, with ipsilateral hypoglossal palsy. Uh, Dejerine is also known as medial medullary syndrome as opposed to lateral medullary syndrome, which is Wallenberg's. And then just another important one to mention here. Uh, is top of basal syndrome, um, which results in um, vision um, or ocular motor symptoms and um, behavioral change. And um, often worth noting that there is a missing motor component in this type of stroke. So patients generally don't have any um, motor functional uh, deficiencies. Investigations um, for brainstem strokes. So really quite simple, just treat it as you would any other stroke. Um, obviously, if someone's presenting with uh, neurological deficits, you you have you have um, a set of um, tests that you can that you need to do to rule out the uh, important mimics of strokes. Um, CT head obviously is vital if you're going to be giving any kind of um, any kind of uh, anti clotting, um, so th um, thrombolysis or mechanical thrombectomy. If if obviously it would be re you would require imaging if you were going to um, go down that route. Um, and obviously also giving aspirin as well is is, um, is not a good idea if, if the patient's had a hemorrhagic stroke. So really looking to rule that out. Um, you also want to exclude hypoglycemia as well, which is a, another quite common um, stroke mimic and can be quite easily reversed. Um, so it's simple to test with a, a bedside BM. In addition, um, as with anything in, in medical school, you want to break it down into stuff that you can do by the bedside, um, bloods and imaging. Um, and then obviously other stuff as well in addition. Um, so the bedside stuff, you might want to consider doing an ECG if you're thinking there might be some cardiac uh, embolic pathology, although perhaps less likely with uh, bazilla uh, brainstem strokes. Um, bloods, um, full blood count, group and save, clotting, INR, usual sort of panel of stuff. Um, and imaging, uh, so in addition to your CT head, you might want to consider a chest X-ray or an echo if there's any indication. Um, uh, of alternative pathology or, uh, or if you're looking for something specific. The management of brainstem strokes, um, again, like any other stroke, so important with any acutely unwell patient, you need to do an A2E assessment um, and that will include obviously um, a full assessment of them and managing any deficiencies they have in each of these sections. So it may include oxygen if they're uh, hypoxic, but obviously to note that not every patient that's that had a stroke will need oxygen and in fact sometimes it can actually be detrimental to give um, a patient who's got normal oxygen sats uh, additional oxygen. Um, airway support, IV access, um, important to make them nil by mouth until the, the swallow has been assessed obviously because these patients could be at risk of aspiration. Um, medical management for these patients, so they're going to need some aspirin, 200 milligrams OD for two weeks. And then they need to be switched to an alternative antiplatelet, usually clopidogrel, um, 75 milligrams for long term. If the patient is presenting within a four and a half hour window, a TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, can be used, such as alteplase. Um, and also, um, these patients can be considered for mechanical thrombectomy, um, and specific guidance exists for this. Um, but access to service is variable depending on the region and what the service provision is like in your, in your local trust. Um, and in addition to this stuff, you obviously want to consider uh, transferring them to a stroke unit where they can be given uh, neuro rehabilitation and uh, other stuff like salt assessments, OT input, etc., etc. So here's just a quick um, summary of the stuff that we've covered on this talk. So the rule of four, really useful way of remembering um, the functional anatomy of the brainstem, breaks it down quite simply um, into the important structures. Um, the clinical features. Try and perhaps for exams um, learn the simple sort of one sentence summaries. Um, but if you are interested, then it sort of can delve further into it. Investigations, obviously, um, the FAST score is, is something that everybody knows. We haven't really touched upon it here because it's not really um, that pertinent to brainstem strokes, but just something to be aware of as well. And then the management, you treat it as you would um, any stroke um, and or any suspected stroke, um, and any unwell patient is, is sort of treated the same. So thank you for listening. I uh, hope it's been useful. As I said at the beginning, my email is on this slide, so do get in touch if there's 
um, any any sort of queries or anything that I can you feel I might be able to help with. Here's some further reading. Um, Life in the Fast Lane is good for an explanation of the rule of four. See also Radiopedia for that as well, which is also quite useful. Um, neuroanatomy uh, and Atlas of Structures, Sections and Systems is good. Um, the nice guidance on ischemic stroke and over 16s is, is very important to learn for um, medical school exams just because it's, it's sort of always tested on. Um, and Davidson's Principles and Practices of Medicine uh, is quite good for um, strokes and pathophysiology. Um, I'd just also like to say thank you to uh, Dr. Reese Davis from the Walton Centre um, for reviewing these slides, as well as uh, Connie Gillespie, the NANSIG events lead, um, for also reviewing them as well. Thank you very much for watching.